go. So I was gonna take a picture. Always. <laughs> it's gonna be test, 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 test. Check, check, check. Can you proof that we're here? Yeah. Like, you have to. If it's not on Facebook, it's not real. Right. You're like, babe, I was not at the Sunday morning <laughs> trip club. I promise. <laughs> check, check, check. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> hello, Commander Flake. Can you hear me? Don't make it creepy, bro. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm a creepy motherfucker. Hey, can, uh, can you uh, turn it up a little bit on my ears so is I can it, actually hear is myself? This one you? I think you're number that three. That was me. That oh. was me. Hello. Oh, my Hello. bad. Oh, yeah, that's good. Check one. Check. Oh, that's good. Good to go. Was that me or right. you? Are you good? Are you good on yours, Greg? My, yeah, um, can, do you mind turning up a little bit? Headphones a little bit? That's good right there. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So uh, we're just going to have a little conversation. Uh, get your life story. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to another episode of the Scuttlebutt Podcast. How's how's it going, Andrew? Hello, Commander. How are you, sir? Um, I'm excellent. I'm pretty uh, excited about this episode because we have the great motivator. With I know us. we've been trying to get him on for months. He's so busy all the time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've been busy recently, but I'm I'm excited to be on here and get to share. So I, I appreciate you guys bringing me uh -huh. on. You're yeah. welcome. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Greg Pease and I, uh, I do, I do real estate and, uh, coaching and it's a passion of mine to do motivational speaking. And, um, I don't know what else should we talk about? What branch of service were you service? We need that piece. So I served in the United States Marine Corps. Hurrah. Hurrah. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Another one. Another I think one. he was setting you up for that. That's awesome. Damn, bro. Sorry. <laughs> hey, we're grunts. We don't know how to use the tech. I know. We stuff. can't have yeah, anything nice. Break. My wife break. says that all the time. <laughs> so, oh, by uh, the way, um, but before we get started, I'm sorry, yeah. Greg. We're uh, Brian, started. Commander yeah, Brian Walker. Started. Oh, well. No, go ahead. <laughs> he loves his podcast, man. Uh, yes. Walker, Commander Walker loves it. He listened to it all the way to uh, uh, Fort Campbell yesterday. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Craig, continue. Yeah. Sorry. Also, now, so where are we at? Um, the way we usually start, we'll just start like, how, how did you end up in the Marine Corps? Why the Marine Corps, for one? And uh, what what brought you in? Because everybody has a story why they wanted to serve. Was it because of 9-11? Was it uh, something else? Like, what, were, what, what got gonna, you there? They were going to give me a gun. Hell yeah. <laughs> it's like That's camping good. with guns. That's right. <laughs> Join the infantry. Hey, it's kind of, well, like I say that kind of um, jokingly, but um, that I really was, I was pretty excited about the the weapons that I would get to play with in the military. <laughs> I'm, I'm being serious. Um, so I joined the Marine Corps from a group home. And um, why the Marine Corps? Well, because we're the best ever, ever. <laughs> so I actually, um, uh, a, a army recruiter had approached me at first and I wasn't even thinking of the military. Uh, I didn't have, I had no clue what I was going to do with my life in any way, shape or form. And so an army recruiter approached me and, and talked about joining the army. And so I said, yeah, that sounds good. I've, I had figured if you, if you can get me in, I said, I would, I would join because I had, uh, some, some past history things already at 17 and um, so he he did he did what he had to do and he got the waivers and so forth. And one of the ladies at the group home she said maybe you should um, explore your options and like talk to some of the other recruiters. And I thought I was like, lady, don't rock the boat. This guy made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> but she so she called a couple of the other recruiters and, and told them like, hey, this kid's you know considering the military, so on and so forth. And uh, a marine recruiter came by. His name was Staff Sarianos, and he was like. Hey, big dog. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Get in the car. <laughs> he, he did. He did. So I got him with him. He takes me to the Marine Corps recruiting office and he sells me on why Marines are so awesome. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm like, I'll do it. What's up? <laughs> I'm like, if, if you can get me in this one, I'll do this one. I did for real. Um, so he, you know, he, he went and talked to the army recruiter and got everything taken care of. And, and, uh, that's, that was really the, the joining the Marine Corps and why the Marine Corps. What year was that when you joined? Uh, 2003. Ugh. Oh, so you were just just two years after 9-11. Yep, yep. And so I was 9-11. Um, I didn't really understand the total um, depth of it. So I was in, what, like 10th grade when 9-11 happened. And I was in a um, detention center. So I didn't even really – I heard about it, like, even, like, after the fact. And um, where I was – 
mentally and even physically at that point in time in life. Um, I didn't, I was more concerned with my safety and things of that nature than even, uh, really having an awareness at a national level. How'd you end up in a group home? Is that something you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah. If, if yeah. Not, it's not a big... No, absolutely. I'm happy to, uh, to share that uh, story. Um, and so when I was, uh, we'll start all the way back at three years old. When I was three years old, my, my biological mother died of cancer and my uh, stepmother was, um, I had two, I had an older brother and a younger brother and my stepmother was uh, abusive to us physically and psychologically. And so that went on, um, all around, well, right about when I was 10 years old. So from three to 10, uh, this all took place and, um, I ran away when I was uh, 10 years old. Uh, the first time I ran away, I wasn't that smart. I was just like walking around the streets and the, the cops had picked me up and they're like, yeah. they're like, Hey, uh, aren't you Greg Pease? And I was like, no, I'm Tom Jones. Or I don't even know what name <laughs> I Tom gave Jones. him. Yeah. Nice. I don't know. Good call. <laughs> yeah. Good call. Good call. <laughs> it was worth a shot. It did not work at all. They're like, no, you're not. Um, <laughs> so they, they took me to the police station and, um, and I, so at this time, up until this point in time, I had never told anyone that my stepmother was abusing us. I was like, just afraid to death. And, um, I just, uh, I thought like, this is the opportunity. This is the time. So I told the cop that I was going to abuse the home. He's like, why'd you run away? And I told him I was going to abuse the home. And, um, they sent me home with my stepmother still. Holy shit. I, Damn. it's just what, that's, that's what happened. And, um, uh, my stepmother, she, she beat shit on me and she told me, she said, if you run away again, you better never come back home. And so, uh, I ran away again shortly after that. And I made sure I never went back home. Um, I ended up in, uh, detention centers and such like that. And I would do whatever I needed to do to misbehave, to make sure that I didn't go back home. Um, they would send me back home. If I followed through with whatever program or whatever I was supposed to do, then I would graduate. My time would pass. I would go back home and there was no way I wanted to go back home. Um, you know, I was afraid of, for my, for my life to go back home. So I would just blatantly misbehave. What, what, what was your dad saying about this? So my dad was a, a over the road truck driver and, um, ultimately, I mean, 90% of the time he wasn't there. Um, but even past that, you know, you still have to wonder, you, you know, you had to know something. Right. And then, so, um, I, I suggest my dad turned a blind eye for the sake of, hoping that it wasn't happening and thinking that he was doing the right thing, providing for the family, but ultimately, uh, left me high and dry. Damn. Is he still in your life today? So uh, yes, the shortest answer is yes. My dad lives in, uh, you know, not far from, from here. And, uh, that was part of my reason in moving to Tennessee. And, um, we, um, here's what I suggest. Uh, so we still have a lot to, hopefully be able to unpack and establish as far as a relationship goes and hopefully get enough time to be able to do so. But where it stands right now, I, I, I love my father as a human. Um, I'm fully at terms that he miserably failed as a father and I want to still establish a relationship with him because I think if I were to mess up, like I believe that, that there's no excuse for, for, for my father's failures. And I believe that, he did the best he could with the resources he had at that time. And if I was in those shoes, I would hope that someone would have mercy on me or, or grace or whatever right. the case may be. Yeah. I hear you. How old were you when you joined the Marine Corps? Um, so I joined the, the delayed engine program when I was 17 and then I left for, so I leave, um, right after I, I turn 18 in March, I graduate high school in May and I leave like, like within like 72 hours of graduating summertime at the island. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was kind of what I did. I joined the delayed entry program. Turn on. I went in in January. Two weeks. Two weeks. Mine, mine was like a whole year because I was an idiot. Yeah, was and like I kept failing high school. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only difference is I was 26 years old. So you are already yeah. an old man. I was, I was, I was, yeah. I, you know what they called me? You were me? on borrowed time. Do you know what they called me? <laughs> hey, well, Greg, what did do, they call do you? Do you know what they called me what every single cramps? day in Paris Island? What? Archibald Henderson. <laughs> Archibald Henderson. Every that's single funny. day. <laughs> I wonder why. And that's for, for you guys out there. Archibald Henderson is the grand old man of the Marine Corps. <laughs> that's funny. So, uh, God, you go to boot camp. Um, how was the crucible for you? I always hear the stories about the crucible. Um, man, I don't know. 
I mean, at the time, so at the time, you know, it's it's the. I mean, I, I don't know. It's the culminating event of yeah, right, boot right, camp, right, as right. they say. So, like at, at that, graduation, at the time, it seems so so massive, and it's built up to be that way. Um, you know, looking back on it in hindsight, you realize how small it is, and and what you're going to go out to accomplish in but life. People literally died doing the crucial mm-hmm. ball. There, pe- people have died. <laughs> There was a kid that died. Um, <laughs> dude, there was a kid that died day one of Paris Island, just you know, like recently, yeah, like a couple months that. ago. And, and that's not, and and that's that's you know that's not. Uh, forgive me for the laughter is not in people's. Oh, uh, no, it's for not. sure, yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. not. Um, but no, no, no. Um, yeah, it's. I I guess it's. I guess it's hard. <laughs> it's been such a long time. Yeah, it's been. Uh, how long ago was it? When did a you long do? Two thousand four. That was okay, right okay, after so, you. Okay, yeah, same thing. I'm yeah, a boot a to you, time. sir. I'm a boot to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, do you uh, remember your crucible? Yes, I do. Oh. Yeah, we so had an L5. I'm like, okay. I don't really remember it. <laughs> For mine, we had we went out there, we hiked out there, and then we had L5. For we got, like, We got flown out. No, I'm just yeah, missing. No, I hope you did. Damn. No, we were under a bivouac. We had a hurricane, and we were under a bivouac for like eight hours of the crucible. And the crucible is like 90, was it 92 hours, 98 oh, hours, sure. something I'm like that? I'm not sure the count on hours. You get one MRE, and you've got to do all these, you know, BWT, uh, battle warfare training, um, night training. You go through this. I remember going in to this little hole, and... Um, there's concertina wire and I couldn't use the bathroom. Well, I did actually, I pissed in that water, um, for everybody else to go in there. And so they all got some of my piss. So (laughs) you're welcome, Fox (laughs) company. You're welcome. He's so (laughs) honest. So honest and generous. No, I just, Hey, Greg, did you hate asking to go to the head in boot camp? I hated it. I, I, you, I couldn't do it. You I was said scared. in boot camp. I mean, I felt like the whole military. That's one thing. I'm I'm gonna. I'm sorry to pause your story for no, a second. No, I was thrown. Whenever in my experience in the military, any time there was never a good time to ask to use. There was never. <laughs> no. There was never. Like you could have been doing nothing for eight hours already, and you're like, "Hey, I'm gonna go over there and take a piss." You got to piss right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, should I hold it for another two minutes? I, I learned to hold it for a so, long time. Um, in Navy boot camp, in the head, there's like twenty commodes all lined up against the wall, but you're only allowed to use the very first one. <laughs> Everything else had to be pristine, you know, yeah, in case yeah, we got yeah, inspected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, was Ooh, that? Is that's that, a good idea. Is that, said, did that happen to you guys, or were no, you guys Marines just? Marines just go fucking piss anywhere. They don't even hit the urinal. But you do They're have like, some we'll great. Scrub it later. You do have great conversations when you're taking craps at, at Paris it, Island. Did you guys have dividers in between <laughs> no, the toilets? No, they, no yeah, you're just like sitting there. Hey, dude, what's up? You're you like, do. Oh, great. Okay, great conversations. <laughs> okay, do you remember a, harp, um, a full metal jacket when they're cleaning the bathroom? Yeah, that's exactly what they look like. Yeah, they're they're toilet here, toilet here, toilet here, right. toilet here, and you get to watch. While someone else is taking a you, shit, you get to. You're taking a shit, you get to. Oh, and you privileged. get to have these conversations like, "Hey, I want to go fuck your sister." Um, <laughs> you know, when I get done with boot camp, I'm like, "Okay, well, what do you got in trade?" <laughs> well, I think this- it was uh, John F. Kennedy that said, um, "You haven't lived life until you brush your teeth next to a guy that's taking a shit." <laughs> that, is, that is true. John F. Kennedy himself true. said that. <laughs> yeah. So. I think there was like 20 commodes, but I think we we're allowed to use the first three. We weren't allowed to use the rest of them just in case the chief came in and inspect us. Oh, yeah. going to be pissed. Yeah. You get a quick, uh, you already know you can get it, that thing cleaned again real quick. Yeah. 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 And my first time going to the head too, I'm like, okay, this is really awkward, man, because there's no dividers or nothing. And you're like, you just go and do your business. And it's like, wow, man, this is. It's open. Yeah. It's wide open. Wide open. And showers. Oh, God. Wagon wheel, remember that? You had to, mm. Oh my you gosh, had like, PT showers. You had yeah, PT showers. Yeah. Five minutes. No, not even, even five minutes. Say five minutes. Sorry, even you, just, you you got nut to butt, and then you just walked around in a circle to clean yourself off. It was disgusting. Yeah, <laughs> but, <laughs> but awesome at the same time. Disgusting but awesome. The uh, the he- the showers on an aircraft carrier when. The ship is in port. It was fine. I always had hot water. But as soon as the ship took off from port, ice cold showers every single day. Oh, so man. Imagine doing brutal. a seven-month cruise 
taking an ice cold shower every single day. How big is your shower? Is it like, is it real just tight like, cramped or? Is yeah, what? it's just like a little foam booth. And then uh, the, the water doesn't constantly run on you on the, the head of the uh, shower head. There's a button. So you just hold the button, wet yourself down. As soon as you let go, the water stops. <laughs> Man, but it's ship life. freezing. At, That's like, horrible. Literally 20 second mute, water. just like That's that. horrible. <laughs> you got to hold the button for your cold water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're like, not only is this water going to be cold, but you're going to hold it down and make it be cold yeah. on you. <laughs> it was brutal. And then on the end of our Westpac that we did, we spent about a week up in the Bering Sea mm. in January. So mm. it's a blizzard outside, literally you know, sailors knocking ice off the deck to so we can land planes. Wow. And then you have to go and take a cold ass shower after a long day of, of being freezing to death. That's awesome. Yeah. It was, That's awesome. No, Bill's, I, character. <laughs> Bill's character. I absolutely that, uh, hate the cold. I hate the yeah. cold. Like I'm I will operate in like extreme heat. The cold on like shut down. You guys looking yeah. at me weird. You guys, you no, the cold I like, I, I, I like, like the cold. cold. I do. Okay. I, I grew right. up in New Hampshire. Of course. I grew up in the cold. I'm from the North also. So. so cold. Okay. Okay. All right. So when, I'm the well, I mean, I was born in New Jersey. You were but born look, in the, Jersey. The yeah, coldest right. don't do it. I mean, yeah, it freaks me out. I get nervous yeah. when I get cold. I prefer to be cold. Start rather, shivering. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd, probably, I'd rather be hot than cold for sure. Ugh. No. <laughs> in Michigan, it gets so cold. Like, literally, you're body just starts convulsing and your back is just all tight just every muscle and, and, your, and then like your your whole back is just feels like you're dying because all your mu- muscles are tensed up and it just it hurts <laughs> it just hurts but man cold weather hurts but i'd rather do that than be like th- these guys are building these houses right here i live in a brand new subdivision for people that can't see us but <laughs> these guys are out there on these roofs uh working 12 hour days it's like a hundred degrees outside with hundred percent humidity. I'm like, I have no idea how the hell they do I that. Can't yeah. do it. I hated it. I, I would mean, die. Yeah. I mean, you were in Iraq, right? Yeah, yeah. You remember you were there in the summertime? Yeah. Ugh. Horrible. So, yeah. Well, you know, hundred and twenty seven degrees in July. Yeah, I mean, come he on. Was, he was insane. I don't know, like honestly, like no like I mean he was insane. Um, but it never like there was never a time where I felt mentally broke because of the heat, but I can tell you I've been in Iraq on all every day of the year and the winter months when it's like 110 during the daytime and out of nowhere, you blink, the sun disappears and it drops down to 40. Yep. Like I thought I was going to like die because of the weather change. <laughs> I just got my, it was so shot. bad. Uh, my first post was OP one alpha in Fallujah. And it was January. It was fucking cold as hell. And I had just so gotten my first desert. anthrax shot. I got pneumonia. I was like, Doc, I got to go. I'm like, nope, you're staying on post. I'm like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sergeant. Did you, did you did your anthrax shot over in Iraq? Uh, right before, like okay, we left, okay. uh, we left January 5th. I got my shot, I think on the 4th. And then we were there on the 5th and we were at our position, uh, our pause, uh, in yeah, the sixth or seventh, we were there real quick. Mm. We went to Al Assad, and then we took uh, a C one thirty somewhere else, and that to to create uh, TQ, and then TQ helicopters to Fallujah. So yeah, it was bad. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, deployments are a lot of moving parts. That's for sure. Now, who are you yeah. with? Um, so two, two seven, seven. Yeah. So yeah. I did well, so, so inside, so I did, um, two deployments with second battalion, seventh Marines, Yuck. you raw, um, <laughs> two seven. <laughs> and, uh, I did one deployment with first tank battalion tow platoon. Whoa. Um, I was still just infantry by trade. They were short. Um, and I was excited about getting to go back. So ominous Donna Dominus, you're a tow gunner. <laughs> Wow. Um have you did wait, did you fire a tow? No, no, we didn't we didn't even we didn't even mount toes. This was two thousand and five. And the toes were uh, they were phasing those out. They right? were phasing them yeah. out. Um th- prior deployments that unit that platoon had had brought and fired toes. Um but on that deployment, um we had brought toes over with us, but we didn't even mount toes. Um we're just heavy guns. Can you uh explain to our, our listeners what a tow yeah, I, I, I know what it is. I have no idea idea what a toe is that commander um, doesn't okay so i'll talk a little bit about it but i'll definitely probably lean in on you i'm not a 
I'm a machine guy. gunner. I'm a 31, man. You're a 11, right? Yeah, 11. So, yeah. so 52s are like between the between the two of us, we can put something together. Yeah, we, we can put something together. Um, so the and if we're wrong, please let us know. But no, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> Someone, you are, we are bound to get eight alive, technically. <laughs> um, so the tow uh, missile is it's this big, heavy uh, missile, and it's wire guided. Wire guided, yeah. So when you shoot it, um, I've never shot one ever, um, but I don't know if there's a screen. But you're there able to move. There's, yeah, you're able to m- maneuver the weapon system and control where the missile goes. So that's kind of cool. I don't know yeah. why they got rid of it. That's a that's well, the a really javelin cool thing. Never fired one of those. I've never, never fired a javelin. The javelins are, um, you know, lock on the target, pull the trigger, and forget it. It'll follow wherever it needs to go to get there. Um, AT fours or M seventy twos. Well, I've fired both those. You have fired okay. Yeah, yeah. The law and the, the law. The law is yeah, awesome. The law. The law so those is are shoulder fire rockets for everyone. They're not uh, wire guided. When you pull the trigger, wherever Sorry, it goes, it's really it goes. nice to have another infantry guy like on on here because now we actually know what we're talking about. But so yeah, I did. Uh, so uh, <laughs> to, to platoon did a deployment with them. Oh five and and into oh six. And then um, when I got back, I so I was going back and forth to Iraq pretty pretty quickly. Um, I was excited about it. I was it was it was my intent to die in Iraq, and I say that just that was definitely my intent at that time. I was very I was honored to get to be able to do that, and I didn't know what else I would do with my life. So I thought that was just the greatest thing that I would do with my life, and I was just going to go back until I died over there. Um, after my third deployment, I, I volunteered to go back to my fourth deployment. I'd only been back for like a week and I heard like another unit that was short. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll go. Um, that was too quick to volunteer. Volunteer. <laughs> oh man, come on. Um, but so they, they screened me for PTSD and I, I had to reenlist it on my third deployment. Um, so when I got back, I was already on the hook for a whole nother enlistment. And, um, when I got back, I was told I'd be non-deployable. So that was after you reenlisted. What? Well, yeah, yeah, because I reenlisted during the deployment. Oh, so I came that, back get that from money. My, I get can't. That oh, money. yeah, it was, oh, it was yeah. good. It was good money. Now I will let everyone know I did the stupidest things in the world with it, but <laughs> <laughs> um, all dumbest things. Okay, um, but tax, yeah, so I, tax free money, tax free coming money. to you. Yeah, yeah, for reenlisting. Yeah, only if I would have had some some knowledge back then. Um, so I reenlisted over there because I was thinking like I'll just keep going back and when i came back I, I volunteered for that fourth deployment that that was the trigger for the like why does this guy so we had dwell time back then george bush put in dwell time so if you're, for every day you spent at war you would be guaranteed a day in peace so if you're in war for 120 days um the military couldn't redeploy you for 120 days after you returned but you could violate your own dwell time so if i did 120 days at war i came back and i was back for 40 days and i volunteered to go back then i could go back if i volunteered. so i had volunteered uh i had violated my dwell prior like twice going back Whoa. before so I, and I, I wasn't paying attention i was just young so <laughs> uh so so that's where i kind of got flagged on that one and then um so so that's that uh so i have like three and a half years on the books and what do i do with it um so i go see the career planner Oh, when I reenlist. Oh, here's a little funny story. When I reenlist in Iraq, I, I took what's called a deferred option. I don't know. Yeah. OK, cool. So the deferred option says so the first time you reenlist in the Marine Corps is the only time that you have you pretty much get your say of what you want. Like when you join the Marine Corps, there's no bonuses. They're like None. the bonuses because we're cool. Not like the right? army, not like the navy. Yeah. But but the but the the first time you reenlist because they just like put you through the ringer for four years and then they're like, by the way, you want to stay for another four? So you get you get <laughs> yeah. you kind of get your pick that that one time. <laughs> so you know you can take you can like pick a duty station or change jobs or be billet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so they're like, what's what's that thing that you want? And I was like, I don't know. So the deferred option gives you a year. To stay in your same billet, your same job, your same duty station, and it gives you 365 days to come back and say, hey, I want this. So that, so you're saying, I'll re-enlist right now, but I'm not sure what I want. Um, and if a year expires, then you're at the mercy of the Marine Corps again, and life goes on. So I re-enlisted, took the deferred option over there, come back, find out I'm non-deployable, go see the career planner. And um, he gives me like a list of things that are non-deployable for an NCO and he's like uh you can there's I think there was Hawaii there was oh is it nice. Uma, Uma, Arizona, Uma, whatever, Arizona, yeah. Arizona and like a couple spots and then there's one spot in Barstow California 
And I was like, Ugh. I was like, it was one. It was like they needed one NCO, one O three eleven NCO in Barstow, California. I was like, that's odd. I was like, what would I do in Barstow? And he was like, probably nothing. He was like, that's a logistics base. I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> so that was, um, I don't know how much you know about. So I, I went out there and I, I got to ride for the. The That's right. Yeah. You rode the horses. Yeah, yes. I had no clue what I was doing, and I show up out there, and it turns out I was uh, going to ride for the Marine Corps Mounted Color Guard, and I did. Um, and that was really cool. I forgot about yeah. that, man. I, oh, yeah. I remember you telling me that story. Damn. Yeah, I got to do, like, um, in 2007, I was not live there, but they did the um, opening ceremony for the Kentucky Derby. Um, each year they're usually the lead element for the Rose Parade. I did get to ride in three of the Rose Parades and cool. all kinds of other just really, really cool major events across the country. We get to show up and do the uh national anthem for. What part of California is that? Um Barstow, so Southern California. Southern. It is um it's the Mojave Desert. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So if you've ever if anyone's I think I think Barstow is exit one for the forty. Whatever that's worth okay. to anyone. Wait, the 40 is in? The 40 like, East. The 40, 40 East, 40 West, this 40. Whoa. Exit 1 is in that's Barstow. That's so cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, you had a really, really good uh, really good Marine Corps Yeah, like, yeah, experience. absolutely. absolutely. At the time, I'll, be, I'll be honest. At the time when I was doing the Mount at Color Guard, I didn't. Um, looking back on it, I uh, appreciate it so much more than when I was there. I was fairly disgruntled while I was there. I was thinking that I should be. No, no. you were not disgruntled as a Marine. But in, in hindsight, like what an honor that was uh, to get to do that. Oh, yeah. So you did all three of your tours were in Iraq? Yeah, all three. So that, yeah, only deployments I did and um, uh, were three tours in Iraq. Um, in no ship time. You didn't go out of me. No, nothing. no. Yeah. Other than the Mount of Color Guard, I don't know. No cool stories. I mean, nowhere. Like no other countries other than like stopping to refuel in germany for like two days like that's about it um well, you didn't go to shannon ireland on the way back i did and, yeah, and yeah, yeah 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 drunk as hell at the yeah. irish bars and well i mean one time we stopped like uh in turkey nice but um but but nonetheless like i haven't been to any ports and i didn't do any muse didn't go to uh, okinawa like there's a lot of cool stuff that a lot of my i tried i tried hawaii done. like after soi they gave you that list remember that list You're like yeah you yeah. get you get hawaii you get, I, I i picked hawaii i picked okinawa and then camp lejeune i got camp lejeune <laughs> with third battalion eighth marines yeah, and totally. you were um, two seven. That's West Coast, correct? West Coast, yeah. So, and I did, I did do SOI in North Carolina. We actually had Game orders. Geiger. We actually had orders to um, Hawaii. We had we had physically had them in our hands, and um, like days before we were to ship out, um, orders got swapped because two seven was short. And so pretty much my whole class from SOI went to two seven and deployed. We, we weren't, we were, we were, I mean, we were kid. I did two, I did two tours in Iraq and stood in America in February, 2005. And I was only 20 years old. I couldn't legally drink a beer. Um, I like, it was like when wow. we went to, when we went to from SOI from the school of infantry, um, we went out to, we got shipped out to California. We were out there for maybe like 10 days and we were off. And we had only graduated high school like ninety. Did you guys do ago. a CAX or anything out there? No, we had, no, we had no. We had no um, training uh, when we went to our first awesome. deployment. Yeah, no, no. Uh, neither did our. Um, and then our, our our seniors were like these disgruntled fools um, because they had spent too much time in Okinawa and thought that they were supposed to have gotten out, but they were actually in war. So <laughs> they really enjoyed life in us. <laughs> uh, man, but yeah. memorize the big green. Uh, yeah, green, yeah, yeah. green book, right? Yeah. Do they stick you on a chair and be like, "Hey, give me this Smiak camera, give me this Bamsus, yeah. you know, JJ tie buckle, give me, you know, give me all this now." The green, yeah, yeah. The, the green monster, five, remember that? Green, green monster. Oh yeah, God, I do. I do. That's the infantry book. That's everything in the infantry is in that green book. <laughs> it's called a pub, right? Um, the pub. I'm not. I've never heard that term. Yeah, I, I don't I, know. That's what they told the machine gunner. Hey, hey. <laughs> Me, all I, all I learned was pick them deep and squad leader's rule and gunner's rule. That's it. That's easy for the machine gunner. Just die, motherfucker, die. <laughs> Just die, pull the trigger. Die. Yeah. Die, motherfucker, die. I was, I, I thought uh, machine gunners is a really cool job. We have a, we, we get to use the 240 and the uh, Mod Deuce and the Mark 19. The Mark 19 is, is awesome. Is awesome. It is amazing. <laughs> that is such a cool boom, weapon boom, system. Boom, boom, boom. 
<laughs> I've uh, I fired the Mark 19 once in combat, um, and I fired both the Mark and the 50 a couple times in training. You know, they make us disnass that thing like in under three minutes. Like you have to do it in under three minutes, or you fail. All I know is where the butterfly trigger is. Half load, full load. What was it like first time somebody shot at you? That's a good question. Um, it was like, actually, so, well, let's go. Well, first, we'll talk about indirect fire, and then we can talk about small arms fire. They all, they happen within a couple hours of each other. Well, let's talk about that. So, um, yeah, so first deployment. So just like graduate high school, like 90 days ago, right? I don't know exactly, but nonetheless, and go over there. And I know nothing about, all I know about war is like the movie Platoon. So I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready, man. And so we get there. First time we leave the wire, I am ready. And we get out there and there's like women and children. They're like, oh, we love you. Good America. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, <laughs> I, was like I thought we were at war. No, I'm dead serious. That's what happened, right? I'm dead serious. And so that goes on for like two weeks. I'm dead serious. Like I am seriously like I didn't. I was, I mean, I was pretty, I'm stupid now. I was real stupid. <laughs> I couldn't wrap my head around what this was. I really couldn't. So like for the first two weeks, like people are like loving that we're there and in, in the area that I'm at. Um, and so I really was like just mind blown. I was like, this is what war is or like, are we just telling people you're war? I just, I couldn't understand what was going on. Anyway, I, I was asking people like, Hey, are we going to get action? You know, what's going to like, yeah, no, it's crazy out there. And I'm like, you guys haven't been on my patrol. <laughs> so we, uh, it's like two weeks in and then, um, we get these orders to go do this, uh, relief in place in like the middle of the night for this unit. That's been like supposedly being getting hammered. The area was called Rawa. Oh, oh and God, Rawa. so we go out there and it's like the middle of the night, like a one for one, like sneak up, like, Hey, I'm your relief. And that guy leaves. And then you take his spot like that. It's like pretty, pretty high speed, low drag. And so I get there and, and the guy that I'm relieving, I'm like, Hey, do you guys get any action? He's like all day, every day. And I was like, yes, I was excited. I was excited. I was, <laughs> oh my he's gosh. like all day, every day. He's like, they try to like take over the, they'll try to like overrun you. And I'm like, I'm I, at the time I'm excited. I'm like, finally some action but you know i don't know no better and uh <laughs> so motivator right here yeah. motivator <laughs> I, well, I was excited about it i didn't know no better but so um so that night and uh get into the next morning and the next day and then um all the next day goes by and we get all the way till the next evening and i'm on post with uh, a buddy of mine and um we get into evening time and I'm like, man, I'm like, that guy said they get action every day. And I'm like, we went a whole day with no action. I'm like complaining. Like, I'm so mad right now. And then we hear this like, this like, doom, 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 like off in the distance. And I was like, damn, I was like, at least somebody's getting some action. <laughs> and then like a couple of seconds later, I learned what indirect fire uh, was <laughs> and just all of a sudden like boom 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 mortars. yeah mortars were dropping oh, on us oh the iraqis and their mortars <laughs> i um i phew, man like had like an outer body experience i didn't even know what to think what to i don't know i remember like diving on the ground and like facing outboard and like i was ready to, to like fight like a whole bunch of people but no one comes, just the mortars. I didn't quite get that at the time. Um, afterwards, my weapon was like loaded with sand. Um, I learned to maybe not dive on the ground the same way I did that time. Um, and yeah, I was, it was, um, I didn't even know what to expect. That was the first time. I, I remember immediately afterwards thinking like, okay, I don't want action anymore. I'm good. We can go back to the other stuff. Um, and it was within a couple hours later, we, we, uh, we had set up, or maybe it wasn't even a couple hours. We set up QRF. I'm not sure how, but I ended up on the QRF and we go across the river into the town where the mortars came from. And we got in a pretty heavy firefight that day. And, um, crack, crack, crack. that was like the firefight was, I, I don't know the science or biology behind it. What I'm guessing is because the adrenaline was so high, it was like everything was happening in slow motion. Slow motion. Yep. Yeah. It was like. Like it was like easy to process, easy to commute. It was like easy to like even talking to people was like as if we're talking right now or even slower, maybe. Or like when someone talks to you and like you can totally process everything they're saying. The only thing I could fathom is because you're the adrenaline, your heart rate's so fast that everything else seems slows, slow. Slows down. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my yeah. my story is just like that, too. Yeah. When I was getting shot at and mortared 
and I was hiding behind a telephone pole. <laughs> and then I'm like, I come in the middle and I'm like, could they see you from the other side? No. I mean, I was, <laughs> no. <laughs> I was like, I think they could see you. <laughs> I was, I, dude, I was thin and in shape and I was, I was like, thin and in shape. <laughs> and then I look over and then my sergeant is like, over like behind a berm of concrete oh, yeah, it's like yeah. far get the fuck over here right now you're gonna die and it's just like wah, wah, yeah, slow. yeah 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 and like, Extreme slow i should have died that day yeah i should have uh, and it was february 14th 2005 in the city of karma and oh, I karma. you remember karma oh yeah 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 uh camp um oh my god what was her uh it was a police station yeah yeah camp yeah, Delta. yeah yeah camp yeah, Delta, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, 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 yep. and i'm it's just like like what you were saying, slow mo. It's like I I was seeing the bullets go by, and I'm like, wow. It, this, yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of like Matrix, like. It but is. W- when was Matrix? That was like in the '90s, right? Oh damn! Did they take it from us? Or did we? Take I, it from I, th- us? I think I think they took it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but dude, I, no, I, I know I totally know what yeah, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So and that they would can't, be but they can't shit where they they can't shit where shit. So. And um, and then after that, I was like, I'm totally cool with them just loving us being here from now on. <laughs> Did you give out uh, soccer balls and beanie babies? Um, we didn't do the soccer balls. Hearts and minds. Hearts, yeah, and, hearts minds. and minds. We didn't do the soccer balls, but yeah, candy, water, whatever you I had. Like, hey, she got a mista, mista. You the, want whiskey? The gum hey. from the yeah, yeah, the whiskey. <laughs> Did you guys take any uh, casualties? Uh, so we did. Um, my first deployment. Um. I think our whole yeah our whole platoon made it back just um, only minor injuries on first deployment, uh, second deployment, um, my, again in my platoon we only had minor injuries and then on my third deployment we lost uh, we lost two people from my platoon, um, but uh, through the company um, each time I think uh, the first time I think we had maybe like eight um, casualties uh, in the company and. I don't remember the total count on the second. Uh, deployment. We lost. We lost eight the first deployment of ours too, and then seventeen the second. That's a lot. Yeah, uh, Ramadi was uh, Ramadi was pretty freaking rough in two thousand six. Yeah, Ramadi. Yeah, Ramadi. Ramadi. Was, that was like cowboys. That was the we yeah, that we, was the we could have used. There you go again. We could have we could have <laughs> used grunts, you in Ramadi. Man. You yeah. would have loved Ramadi. It's a lot of action, man, every yeah. day. I heard about it. I didn't even. I passed through Ramadi once or twice, but we would always hear about it. Um, I think three three seven. I was about to say, I think three seven yep, got they in lost there. Yeah, about yeah, thirty five yeah, 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 yeah. guys the year before. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. Um, yeah, Ramadi was definitely uh, a major, major, major hotspot. I mean, when well, after the push in Fallujah, that's where everything shifted to. And then I don't know why we didn't do a push in Ramadi. We just kept kind of. Yeah, we did. You know, we so. took it from a red zone to a orange, and then we gave it back to them, and then it just got fucked up. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, leader. I want to ask you a question that I asked our last guest. Ooh, the staff sergeant. Yes. So. With everything that you've been through with your, in your life, um, being abused as a child, seeing death and destruction in Iraq, um, how do you stay believing in God, seeing all this death and destruction? Yeah, um, that's a, a great question. And, and um, here's, how, here's how I quantify that into words. So everything at all times is an equal balance of good and bad everything even down to the molecular structure of the table that we're resting on right now has to be equally balanced with a positive charge and a negative charge and if at any time if that balance were imbalanced we would implode upon ourselves i say it's saying it's getting very scientific on a on a um quite on a spiritual question. Um, but my answer is that if God protected us from everything dark and evil, did we really make a choice for God? There has to be an equal and opposite choice. So evil has to exist for us to actually make a choice for good. That's pretty good. That's deep. That's freaking deep, man. That's deep. 
Oh, you've been thinking about that for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 well, and I mean, when you say if you think of, thinking about that for a while, yes, yes. I mean, I had to rectify like, and this is my own journey. Um, but like, one, I don't want to say, but I, I had resentment against God for a while as to why did He let my childhood happen to me. Right. So yes, I definitely had a lot of thought and processing and going into that. Yeah. Why would God let? Our friends die in Iraq. Like I, I said the same thing. I mean, it, it, I, cause I, I defied, I, I defied him. I, I didn't believe him for at least three years while I was in Iraq. And now I've kind of turned the page and been, I kind of let him back into my heart. And, good. and I don't know. It's, it's, it's all good. Maybe to stop drinking. I don't know if that, you know, that's definitely been a part of it. Oh, I'm sure. I'm um, sure. You know, my going to, you know, save a warrior. And I definitely want to do your program, which, by the way, we definitely need you to talk to our boys at 12206. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I look forward and to set it. Up, uh, set up some comes. kind of a education yeah, 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 for, for us. Sure, for I sure. think uh, a lot of people would get tremendous stuff out of it. Yeah, I believe that, and uh, and I'm 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 here for it. Once, yeah, we'll we'll get that all lined out for sure. And we'll get lunch. We'll get Mission Barbecue to come down. We'll do like what? What's like an eight hour thing? Uh, so we'll, we'll and we'll we'll yeah we'll customize it for okay. yeah 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 we'll set. We'll I'm looking it, forward yeah. to it. Yeah, because Katrina, my wife, she did yours. Yeah, and she yeah. had a she she thought it was awesome. That's awesome. I'm so I'm glad to hear that. Hey Briggs. Hey buddy. Yeah, I had tickets to your thing, but here's why I didn't show up. Yeah, I had this weird thing about if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. <laughs> no I left this Wait. house. One hour and a half before the kickoff of your your deal, it, I think it was in like Spring Hill. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. left an hour and a half early out, and I'm looking at my GPS. I'm like, it takes about forty five minutes, so that gives me plenty of time. I brought my laptop so I could do a little bit of work in my truck before I get in there. I hit the road. Uh, there's construction on eight forty. Eight forty was shut down. Yep. So I remember that. I'm like, all right. I, it's a good thing I left an hour, half, hour, 45 minutes early. And I sat there for like an hour. So finally, my uh, my gas gauge was reading red, right? So I <laughs> typed in my GPS, find the next gas station. I'll hit the gas station, and I'll zip over to the Greg P. Yeah. show. Yeah. So I get to the gas station, fill up, and I take off again. Well, my GPS doesn't let go of the gas station. So it loops me all the way around Spring Hill, comes back around, I pull into this building, and it's a little office building. I'm like, hey, this this must be it, but there's nobody in the parking lot. And I look over to the right, the gas station's right there. It took me all the way around and brought me back to the gas station. <laughs> I was like, damn it. And I look at my watch, look at my GPS. It's, it's, I'm 20 minutes out. I'm like, I could still make it. I freaking fly all the way down the freeway, pull in. I think it was like a UAW place. Yep, 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 yeah, yep. so I pull into the UAW. I run upstairs and you're already up there talking. But I have this thing like I, I just couldn't bring myself in interrupting your class and walk oh in while you're talking. Oh my gosh! I wish. I, oh, you should have came in. <laughs> I was right there and I looked no in and you were already way. talking. I was like, oh. when, when is your next <laughs> oh, uh, man? Next so class. I, well, so the goal setting that so that was a goal setting workshop and I'll ha I'll have the dates out soon for the next goal setting workshop. I got it re revamped a lot. I've had a lot of help from some of the peers that I went through a recent personal development with. So I'm definitely excited about that. And then outside of the um, goal setting workshop, I, I now do uh, certify people in timeline therapy and neuro linguistic programming. And we can talk a little bit about that. My, my next course for that is November 1st through November 6th. Um, go ahead. You're looking like, no, yeah, it's, okay. just, <laughs> it's like, Wow, timeline therapy. You're, you're like breaking all these molds of what a jarhead's like, supposed to be. <laughs> right, right. Wait, we're not it's supposed funny. to think Yeah, you're like supposed that. to be like in the corner drooling and eating crayons, man. <laughs> uh, <That's funny>. More <laughs> crayon shit. <laughs> oh, man. It. Every, it can't be one day without the crayon thing. One hey, day. Listen. We, did, we do it to ourselves. We do, to, it to we ourselves. do it to ourselves. I have to listen to your stupid stories about the chem lights, man. This is so... I'm going get, to get you back. On yeah, this one, <laughs> I know, Commander. I, I was stupid. I was a dumb Marine. And we <laughs> wanted sleep. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I gotta hear it. Gotta you hear got it. you. You've never heard this story. No, I don't think okay. so. I don't so think when so. you're on ship, have you guys right? done it on the podcast before? Hell yeah. We, 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 I mentioned it a couple I times. Mentioned it. Yeah. Okay. 
So, okay, when you're on a ship, um, the Navy, basically, they own that ship. And we are guests in the birthing area. Okay. And so they have this thing called general quarters. They have this thing called man overboard. And there are different drills that they do to keep sharp. And um, so my guys, um, when they got tired, we couldn't go back to the birth. We can't sleep during the day. We have to be up and we have to be about like all the time. We can't go back to our birthing and just take a nap. That's a stupid rule, by it the is way. It is a hugely <laughs> stupid rule. <laughs> so if my guys were tired, like I was in charge of $500,000 worth of stuff. And I had it all on one key in the birthing area. Like it was uh, chem, chem lights, uh, batteries, you know, uh, JP8 cans, all kinds of shit. And the chem lights are introduced. <laughs> <laughs> and so my guys, I figured this out. My guys, if if I threw a chem light overboard that stops the Navy like man overboard drill. So we have to go back to our birthing and sleep <laughs> and the Navy has to work. Oh man. And I did that. This um, is already I did good. that about four or five times on, uh, on our cruise. You're a horrible human. I'm a horrible. He is I'm horrible. horrible. I'm, I'm glad to hear that story. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, Dude, uh, they would pay me money and I would just like break open. A, a man overboard drill could literally go for like four or five hours. <laughs> yeah. too. You know what I'm saying? It's horrible. And we'll go back. We'll go back. And we'll watch oh, our TV. Man. We'll take a nap. We'll play PlayStation. <laughs> or, uh, World of Warcraft was was a big thing back then. World okay. Of Warcraft. All right. I have a um. I have a confession story. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> it's coming out. Yeah. 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 Um. So I, yeah, I've shared this one a couple of times. Uh. So um. ASP Dulab. Do you remember? Is that okay? Okay. So it was a um, ASP Armor uh, Ammo uh, Supply Ammo point. Supply Point. Yeah. Um. So there was this uh from from the um Gulf War. We kind of kind of peeled out like we did uh, in Afghanistan. <laughs> but uh, so there was a lot of uh, American ammunition over there that um, they during at the end of the Gulf War, I guess they just like uh, maybe I don't know if they put I don't know what specifically was done, but they attempted to just blow it. But really, it just expanded a lot of it. So um, the Iraqi in the back in the beginning of the war, they would just come and just pick up one five fives and shells and whatever they wanted, And um, even the propellant like you could get just like boatloads of the propellant that goes inside the 155s it looks like like rabbit food i don't know if you're yeah yeah, yeah 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 like boatloads of it so they would just go get this stuff and use it against us and build ieds that's where the that's why they started building ieds because they had like all the supplies for it yeah so um it, when it got when they attempted to blow it up it was like it got expanded it was like 10 clicks by 10 clicks of like random ammunition all over um and so we would go out there and um man it and like we would just i mean it's hard to keep an eye on 10 clicks so we just randomly set up like two people here two people okay and at this time this is the beginning of the war in the beginning of the war we still did um the 55 gallon drums and burn shit by the by my second deployment i think we started using those wag bags those waste alleviating yeah, wag gel. Bag, yeah. yeah 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 but first one we were I still had. i had wag bags wag bags yeah. We were, yeah we were still burning shit on my first deployment like that we is actually, disgusting we burned yeah, shit, i don't know how yeah. we weren't past that it, but, but yeah. we burned shit in the bags and that was even was, you had a you wow. had a pretty bad, but we would t we would make fires and we'd take our little bags and just throw them in. That shit was terrible. So, oh god! How, how do you get shit to catch on fire? Uh, <laughs> uh, JPA, <laughs> JPA, a lot of JPA, the, a lot of JPA. That's that's the actual <laughs> when you actually stir and burn shit. Ugh. We had the great idea that we would take all these. So inside of a 155 millimeter shell, there's these like. It looks like rabbit food, but it's like this very high flammable propellant, and that's what propels the projectile. So we would take and make this oatmeal mixture of poop and this propellant. Well, I say we would. We did it once <laughs> because what we figured out, what goes up must come down. It didn't, it didn't work out too well. Um, but let me let me share with you something that wow. I've only told like a few people ever, and I feel like uh, yeah, that we're please. in the trust tree, and you know, there's only like you know, only, we are, only we are you two are the only people that are ever going to hear this. So yeah, for sure. we're in a safe, <laughs> exactly. we're in a safe place. We're in a safe place right now. So I had some. Um, I don't know why I did this, eighteen year old Greg. Why you thought it was a good idea? But I took some Russian uh, fifty cal rounds that I found out there. I just thought they were really cool. They're like a, just a little bit bigger than ours, and. Um, I had them like I just thought they were cool, and somewhere along the lines, I thought it was a good idea to dispose them. Okay, in the burn pit. Uh, so that's where I threw them. Uh, and a little while later, they started going off. <laughs> no we're, one. We're being invaded. 
good. No one, no one, no one got hit by any of the projectiles, and I never admitted that it was me until today. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your lieutenant colonel? Right. I'm, gonna, I, I'm gonna give him a call. Make sure he's on this podcast. <laughs> Retro some punishment. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. We can't get NJP anymore. So uh, the stories come out. Listen, uh, yeah. Did I've, you did I've, you ever get NJP'd? I got NJP'd. Maybe only twice. Twice. Maybe. Wow. Um, it was article just once for this guy. Um, yeah, I got in trouble a couple of times. So I was in what? The <laughs> if you don't mind me asking. Um. So, um, I'm trying to think on the first time I got in trouble. Did you punch an officer? No. Damn. No. 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 Um. I forget, but actually, so the second time I actually got in trouble for drug use. Uh oh, I did. Um, what kind of drugs? Yeah, was so when, <laughs> what kind of drugs yeah. are you doing? What kind of drugs? Um, Ecstasy, marijuana. No, cocaine. yeah, yeah. Um, just you all know. Of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Little acid. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, just, just uh, marijuana, and um, but yeah, uh, and um. Yeah, that was later. That was like, and that was after my deployment. So it was like in, I don't know, maybe 2010 or so. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations. Burn Congratulations. Out. Hey, I got, hey, I was drinking in Iraq in 05. That's, yeah, I, I got battalion level in JP. I had to go in front of Stephen, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Neary, who uh, was just in the news for using the N word last year. He mm. got, it was a two star. He got fired. I bet. That's for horrible. That. I don't know why he would do that. He was a VMI grad. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, so they so the engine paid you for drinking Iraq. That's horrible. Yeah. I was uh I was on every I was on a shit detail. Uh I was for six months. Like the entire after I like because it was really early in my Marine Corps career and really early on my first deployment. So I was on every working party, every convoy. And I cleaned every single port of shitter in fucking Camp, Camp Felucia. <laughs> every single thank, one. Thank you for the clean port of You are so welcome. <laughs> but then, um, because that was my punishment. Um, so when I got back and were, like. Were they trying to make an example? Yeah, they, they they definitely made an example. That's what I was thinking, right? Because yeah. drinking over there, come on, man. Well, like, okay. we're, about, we're about to die. Can we have, like, <laughs> can we have a Greg. shot of Jor Jordan Gin here? Greg, you've heard the stories, right? Of the Listerine bottle filled with Jack Daniels? Maybe not. That was me. Okay. Um, all packages had to be checked because of my little fuck up. Because hmm. they didn't check packages. But my cousin, uh, senior VP of Brown Foreman, uh, and Brown Foreman owns Jack Daniels, sent me. A bottle in a Listerine because it looks exactly the same. We got fucked up and I went to the chow hall in the battalion's uh, battalion commander's uh, car with the battalion <laughs> commander and the battalion sergeant major, Rick James. <laughs> Rick I swear James. to God. <laughs> I swear to God that was his name. And I went there, went to the MWR, and then I was like, you know what? I want to drink some more. So I went back to the Pogues at Camp Fallujah. <clears throat> Every single one of them had a bottle. <clears throat> I went back to the MWR, hammered, passed out on a Jersey barrier with my M16 in between my legs. <laughs> <laughs> so this, I don't think this helped your case, but keep no, going. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I woke up to a guy going like, you know, you can't see what I'm doing, but he, he, he tapped my shoulder and I look up and I'm like, Ooh, gold oak leaves. <laughs> 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 Shit. He's like, you okay? I'm like, uh, I'm dehydrated, sir. And I was not dehydrated. I was drunk as hell. And they took me I'm back to hydrated, sir. They, they took me back to Charlie Mad, <laughs> and uh, Master Sergeant. He's a Master Sergeant now, but Gunny Hill was my platoon uh, platoon sergeant. He comes over and he gets the truth out of me. He's a Master Sergeant now, and he remembers that story till the day he dies. Yeah, and he's in North Carolina, and we talk all the time. And he's like, "Remember when you got drunk in Iraq?" I'm like, "Yes, I do, yes, Master Sergeant. I remember. Thank you." <laughs> But no, that's that's that, that was my NJP, and I still got a good cook, uh, a good cookie, and I'm I happy. Did, I did too. You um, did too. I did too. With two NJP, wait, With two? No, I, yeah. Uh, or maybe I, maybe, I had, maybe I didn't have a, and maybe the other one wasn't. You were um, seven oh, three, years, right? Uh, eight years. Eight years. Oh, because you only need three years for a good cookie, right? Okay, that's right. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So so I I, I I skated in there. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so did I. Um, I, mean, I, I, I. I just got it, man. I just missed the mark. I drank twice, and I I think it was twice. It could have been once, Um, but I got real sloppy. If I, I forget if it was twice. I got real sloppy once if it was twice, and then I decided not to do it anymore because... Well, probably shouldn't be that sloppy at war. <laughs> I was out. I was out. Out in like like fobs. Yeah, and I and I got pretty drunk one night. I was on post. Getting drunk on post. I did. Really? Yeah, I was the. Um, Who was your corporal of the guard or sergeant of the so guard? So I was. We have to talk to them. So I was the. You were the COG. I was the COG. Oh my god! <laughs> I remember. Um, I think th- to I think- call the COG in case of fire. Oh fuck. That's general That's, order how number horrible. eight. How horrible is Seven? that? Seven. I remember, like that. uh, I think, the, I think the kid's name was thread at the time. And I was like, thread, was, what's the thread thread go? I think that's nice. Name. That's a good name. And I was like, I was like, there I was like, what time is it? And like, whatever time, you know, yeah, zero two or something. I was like, what time is our post at? Maybe zero five. So we still have like a couple hours left. I was like, all right. I was like, they look for me. Tell them I'm going to take a shit. <laughs> 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 Went found a little corner to hide in. <laughs> but uh, and you yeah. were, this was at a fob. Yeah, it was. This was in um, uh, was it Ferris? Is that what the name of the town was? Um, but but yeah, nonetheless, it was a yeah, it was a, it was. A, Where are you guys like? To Crete, Samara, like no, um, Ferris, Amaria, um, oh, Amaria, Tower uh, Town. What was that one with the water tower? It had yeah. a water tower in four quadrants. Oh, whatever yeah. that town was. Yep. It had a water tower in the center, and it was like four quad. It was a real small little town. Karma. Oh, it might have been because Karma had a water tower. I bet it was Karma. a big one. And if you see the UGG on the water tower, that's from us. <laughs> you got goosed. Our first sergeant was. First Sergeant Guzman. So he, uh, every time you got in trouble, you had to go see First Sergeant Guzman. So somebody went, went up to that t- water tower and put UGG on the water tower, and it's still there. That's and if funny. you go up and down the East Coast to the different bathrooms, if you see a UGG, someone from 38 India Company was there. Somebody from 38 <laughs> was there. And it's not all me. I've got like 127 other guys that you can blame. <laughs> Okay, it, was, it wasn't all me. I, I did it a couple times. Sorry, Goose. So, so how how long did you serve? Uh oh, uh oh, so, turning the tides right now. Dun dun dun. I, uh, I was a three by six. So I did three years active, three years reserve, and then after my enlistment, I reenlisted again. But I only did like two years, and I was like, hey, um, start start a family by that time, and I was. I was working a lot, seven days a week. So I went to the Navy reserves and said, hey, can I uh, get out of the reserves because you guys are costing me money? Because I was working Saturdays and Sundays. So all that time was time and a half and double time. And they said, yeah, we can let you out. But uh, if you get out, you can never come back. And I was like, yeah, I think I'm pretty good with that. So I probably mm-hmm. did like yeah. eight years. But only three of it was active duty. But you were on the USS on, Carl, USS, Carl Vincent. USS Carl Vincent. Yeah, it was amazing. The um, most so amazing about, battleship. So forgive me. Tell me about the little bit about Carl Vincent. The Carl, what the guy? No, uh, the ship. The oh, ship. The guy. Sure. I was on the queer. Forgive, bars. forgive my ignorance. But no, I'm, I was uh, on the. I was on an LHD three. He was on a the, big carrier. Yeah, Carl Vincent's a carrier, and it was, was named a after guy. a congressman, the like Carl Vincent. I think he had. He was like the grandfather of the United States Navy or something. And we've got okay. how many okay. people in our VFW post that were served on the Carl Vincent? I know of at least two of us. We got myself, you and Chris. Chris. What yeah, about Paul cool. and uh Anthony. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Paul and Tony was, too, right? Yeah, I was yeah, Paul and Tony. So if we got four guys from our post that served on the same boat. At the ship, same time, I, I know you, you, Paul and Tony, but the other gentleman, did you guys serve same time or different? No, time, he's a boat? lot younger. He's okay. a boat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Chris we're, Rice, we're, you are a boot. We're all we're all boots to we're all We're all boots. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> what years? What years were you? Um, eighty five, active duty eighty five to eighty eight. I got I got out. Dude, I see time. what I you was, just did. What you just kind of like just took over, and just oh. now we're interviewing Fleet right now too. <laughs> so you were getting a twofer in one day. So that's pretty good. Yeah, no, that's funny. Yeah. Um, eighty five. So, um, I'll just go ahead and drop the bomb on you. That's when I was born. Eighty five. Eighty five. Damn. I had just gotten back from the Olympics in California. That was eighty four. So eighty five. I have How, no idea what I was doing. What What age were you in eighty five? Do you need my toes? nine? I was yeah. nine years old. I can bust out some toes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, was, I was about eight or nine, okay. something like that. Okay. 
right. I was, I was born 77. So and we know Fleek was at least 18. We won't ask him how old he was. <laughs> no. In 85, I was 19. Oof. I turned 19 in boot camp. I turned 21 in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Jeez. Yeah. Wow. Does the, um, uh, is it is it just Navy or is it Marine Corps or do we take it from them? But like when you go, like when you cross, what's it called when you cross the equator? The equator. Shellback. Yeah. And then so is that? Yeah, my form is literally right. Yeah, so and, right I'm, I'm okay. a, and I'm a shell back too. <laughs> okay, no, you're I'm basically not, yeah, no, I'm not. you I'm go not. across uh, the equator, and the Navy hazes the shit out of you. Yeah, I can't run because of them. <laughs> Before that, you're, a, you're, you're I have a, a hard time doing you're yoga. You're a polywog. After you cross the equator, you're a shell. You're back. a shell back. A polywog <laughs> is the lowest form of life. They don't have no arms and no legs. No you're arms, slimy, no legs. Slimy and, little <laughs> bastards. Dude, I had <laughs> well, they good. made us they made us eat green eggs and ham on the mess deck with like, just our faces. <laughs> yeah. Your hands are like tied behind your back. Oh, that's great. And they made us it. make a little like well, we were in our skivvies, like our our yeah. silkies and our, our green on greens. They made us make a little polywog tail for the whole ceremony. Yeah, you have to crazy. wear your you have to wear your clothes inside out inside and backwards. Out, yeah. Like your underwear is on the outside of your yeah your dungarees. Well, we wore dungarees, so so everything is backwards. And then after you graduate, and the way the way you, you go through this whole thing, and it's hours long, and after you're you've been humiliated, you know, you got your, <laughs> your literally your ass beat, you're bleeding. Like if yeah. you're not bleeding by the time you're done with it, they didn't you, you didn't do it right. <laughs> so. uh at the very end, that you know, they find the fattest chief and they set him up on a on the like a stage. He's sitting in a chair. He's uh, King um, Neptune. King Neptune. So you have to go up to King Neptune, and he's like dressed the part too. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's got, got he's got a trident. He's yeah, got, trident, and he's got a woman next to him, but it's not a woman. It's some dude that's dressed like a woman. It's, it's, it's yeah, a bitch. King, yeah, King Neptune's wife. So, that's right. You, you don't pass go until you pull. You get the. You can only use your teeth. You have to get a uh, olive out of his belly button. I, I didn't have to do that. that they, they did away with that. Like, and she was like, I was not. No, I was that. not a part of that. But we had to do, I mean, we had to. Andrew's like, like, that is not. We were you know, allowed the, to, Andrew's like, we were allowed to use our tongue. The, the fucked up thing is when you do that, when you go in for the belly, or for his, uh, the olive, uh, he's, his whole belly is all greased up too, right? So when you, when you go, when you go in with your teeth to grab this olive, he grabs your ears and just goes. Bah! <laughs> yeah, we didn't have that. Oh, yeah, they man. got rid of that because that was, I think, that was considered hazing or oh, whatever back yeah, then. It was back, back when I did it. They had these makeshift coffins, and then for like a whole month before you get to the equator, the Cooks are just saving all this nasty food and just throw it in vats and they're saving it. So it's like all fermented and nasty. <sighs> they pour it in these makeshift coffins. And one of the stages, you have to lie in this coffin and they close the lid and they pick it up and they shake you. And you're just like, all this shit's flying on you. And if you're not lucky enough to go first, which probably you're not that lucky because there's 5,000 guys on the ship. Probably a good half of it, half of them are going through this. So there's probably like 2,500 guys going through this all on one day. There's vomit in there also because yeah. that's how bad it is. Uh, we had we had 900 go through. Yeah, uh, it's pretty rough. Time. <laughs> Dude, we they they. So now I'm not so mad that I didn't go on ship. We had to blow yeah. the water out of the tie downs that they do for the helicopters. Yeah. Like they they took a hose out and they sprayed us. And they would like, okay, now there's four people. You got to fucking blow the water out of these tie downs. And you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and the water's coming in. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's, dude, it's crazy. It's so dumb. <laughs> We're doing flutter kits. Yeah. We're doing monkey fuckers on the deck of the ship. Oh, We're doing man. duck. Well, I had to duck walk the entire yeah. length of the ship. That was t- over knee knockers. It's terrible. That's why my knees are all fucked up right now. That's funny. Yeah, you're not allowed to walk because polywogs don't have arms or legs. So yeah. everything you're, you're on, you're literally your hands and knees. Yeah, hands and knees. So uh, and, and, on, on, a fl- oh, yeah. on a carrier, it's all non-skid. So mm-hmm. literally when you're done, your your palms are your hands and your knees are like freaking hamburger. Yeah. It's just like blood. My clothes were so jacked up. I stripped naked on the flight deck and just threw all my clothes overboard in the Indian ocean. Littering. And I walked back to my birthing area, butt ass naked. Awesome. Just going through there. <laughs> Dude, going through that, the, you, the, I, the you passageways. Never told me that story. Yeah. That's awesome. Butt ass naked, walking across the flight deck of aircraft. Carrier, well, you couldn't go do down. that now because now they got women yeah, on the women. ship. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm not uh I'm not so let that I felt yeah. yeah. I'm a, I'm a, you know, and I'm You're just gonna polywog. I'm gonna remain a land polywog for the rest of my life and be happy with that. <laughs> We could do some. Yeah, but get a sweet ass certificate. I'm good. We could get a sweet ass certificate. Get a sweet ass certificate. Yeah. I'm I'm good. You got your your show back. Uh, so, it's, it's it's in Savannah. So and, essentially, once you cross the equator, then then you get you garner more respect from there. Or now, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. Now your show back for now, the rest of your life. So next name, time no. next time you go over the the equator, you're the one. Raising hell, on you're the, raising hell on the and, and It's like a tradition. It's it's a navy tradition that's been gone. For have you got hundreds? To, have you got to be? No, uh, no. I left in 08. I was like, I had three deployments. See ya. I'm out of here. Yeah, yeah. I should have stayed in. I wish I had stayed in. But now we get to sit here and do this. And now we get to sit here yeah. and do this. So and, uh, and talk about after stories. you get out. Did you go straight into real estate? No. So when I got out of the military, I actually had a real truff, tough trough. Truff. Real, real trough, uh, real tough time transitioning. Um, I didn't, so I had, um, I didn't have, uh, um, family or friend to be, to be r- quite candid. I didn't know how to take care of myself as an adult. Yeah. <laughs> and, Me neither. and, Me too. um, and the military does not, they don't pay you on the first and fifteenth after you get out. Nope, and, <laughs> and and they don't set you up for success, and, which they said they do, but they don't. And you cannot go back in and eat out of the chow hall. <laughs> no, no, you no, can't I get the bag know, nasties. I didn't know how. I mean, I was. It's it's my fault. You know, I didn't pay attention enough in in hindsight. Um, but I didn't know how to write a resume. I didn't. I didn't even know. I mean, I really was not prepared to. I truly was not prepared to take care of myself as an adult. And uh, so I had a really rough time transition. And all in all, I did uh, between there and here, I ended up in car sales and I did not know how to do sales. I was not a talker. I went in there and asked them if they needed someone to, I I had no job. I had uh, an eviction notice. I was living in a studio in this like ghetto area in California. And um, the, uh, the guy that was like managed property managing, he was a Marine luckily. So he was pretty much let me squat there after I should have been evicted. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Um, so, and I couldn't even like, I was going places applying for jobs, like even like gas stations and stuff and not getting the call back. Uh, it was, I was rough. So I, I go into a car dealership and I ask them if they need someone to wash their cars. I'm like, I can't fuck that up. Right. <laughs> and so they're like, no, they're like, we have a Porter. I didn't even know what that meant. And I literally told the guy, I was like. I will clean the shitters cleaner than they've ever been. I was like, I need a job. And he was like, well, I like your tenacity. You want to try sales? <laughs> so yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know what sales were, but he was like, well, go clean up a little bit and we'll give this thing a shot. So I found myself in car sales. And honestly, that was a really, um, wow. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and sa- car sales was a, a great environment for me. Um, it was a great catalyst. Um, that was the first, I didn't realize how, um, I didn't realize how fake people were at the time, but it didn't matter. It served its purpose. That was the first time people, there was an environment of people that are like, yeah, you can do more. You can win. Good job. That was the first time uh, that I really like experienced that in my, my childhood. I didn't get that or my adolescent and during the Marine Corps motivation sounds just a little bit different than that. <laughs> to say so, the least. So um, I was empowered. I was like, this is really cool. I started like reading books um, and uh, going to, I went to one or two seminars that uh, it, during when I had first like established a little bit of money in car sales and started reading these books and really just started, um, I would read a book and I would just like implement one thing into my life. And like whatever the whole book, I would just take one thing and I would go do that thing. Like until it was like second nature for me. And, um, so I did car sales for two years and I thought oh, I could do this all by myself. So I started a, um, actually I moved out here to Tennessee with like pretty much nothing. And I started a cleaning company. It was called GT custom cleaning. And, um, and so the cleaning company went, I mean, it went well. Um, so I went and got like a whole bunch of cleaning contracts and I end up needing employees. Mind you, I, I don't know how to run a business at all. Like I have no like schooling, no nothing, but I'm like just doing it. But just by the things I read in these books, like integrity, discipline, like people are hiring me. 
So at the end of uh, at the end of the day, I'm like hemorrhaging money out, trying to pay people too much, trying to get them to show up because I didn't know how to actually hire quality employees. I didn't have like a handbook. I didn't have SOPs. So we're paying too much for people to try to get them to show up. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm working like 24 hours a day and there's like nothing left of it. So we were able to acquire accounts for this business, but I didn't really know how to run a business. And, um, during this time I started, uh, I actually started serving tables at TGI Fridays in Franklin, which is no longer open. Nice. And I went, what happened was uh, it's a funny story. Um, so my wife and I, I met my wife when I first moved out here to Tennessee, we've been together for about 10 years now. And so we went on a date night to TJ Fridays and we were not, we're not making that much money, um, in comparison to what's bills and child support and all the insurances and you name it, it's car payments. And, um, so we go out and we do this little, um, date night. And I told my wife, I was like, I bet I could probably do, um, I could serve and like a couple nights a week. I'd never served before. I'd never worked in the restaurant industry. I was like, I probably could serve and make the money for our date nights. So it doesn't have to come out of our bank account. And my wife was like, yeah, that's a good idea. In hindsight, like, where does the time come from? <laughs> right. yeah. But I went back in there and I was like, hey, I'm going to serve for you guys. And they're like, who are you? Um, but they, they gave me a spot and let me start serving. Well, I um, so at this point in time, <sighs> since being out of the military, I've so now as an adult, we have the military. We have a little bit of uh, we've done some car sales and then we go run our own business, which if you want to call, I mean, technically we were, I mean, it was a shit show, but we were running our own business. And then I go into the restaurant industry. So I really brought that like ownership mentality, that discipline. I didn't really know what I had, but within six months, um, I ended up being a, um, a salary manager for, um, the, like a hospitality manager. Yeah. And then I did that. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So I served for six months and they, they offered me a spot management. I took it. I loved it. I really loved getting to empower other people. Like every day you come in, like, I don't care if you've served in a management position, I don't care what arena it is. 90% of the time until, unless you have a really good culture and if you do cherish it. Um, but 90% of the time you're going to come in and the people under you are just totally beat up every day and you have to reinflate them every single day. I was excited to do that. I enjoyed doing it. Um, so within like, maximum of like a four year span. I went from doing that to becoming a kitchen manager at the Opry Mills location to become an assistant general manager and then to becoming a general manager with Buffalo Wild Wings and all that just progressed really quick. Um, but during those, uh, I, I gave up the cleaning company, ended up selling the cleaning company. Um, so now we're heavy in the real, uh, not real, we're not in real estate yet, <laughs> heavy in the restaurant industry. And so the whole time we're in the restaurant industry, just still devouring books. Um, in 2015, I set a goal to read 12 books and I read 25 that year. And then, um, Jesus. 2015 was the transition from the cleaning company. That's when I started serving. Um, and then, so each year just, just na nailing out these books. And then like, I was using the, the subordinates, the people that were working under me all the way up to becoming a, a general manager. There's managers working under me, making 50, 60, $70,000 a year. I was using these people as a experiment with what I would learn in the books. So I'd take what I'd learn in the books and I would say, here's how you should lead people. And so I'd go give it a shot and, and see what was the reaction that I would get. And then how do I need to tweak it? And how do I get the exact reaction that I need? And how do I empower these people and get them to propel in their life? Um, every manager that worked under me in the restaurant industry before I got out um, was promoted, every single manager, to include the assistant general manager that worked under me became and is the general manager right now in the store. So in 2000, about three years ago, um, we're doing restaurant industry. We are um, killing it. Um, I'm enjoying it. And I'm like, there's more out there. <laughs> so I had the passion for real estate. And I've said the whole entire time since I've been in real estate, um, my passion for real estate was really, I wanted to be able to expand my network. And I really thought that real estate was going to be that piece. Um, I, I have, I'm happy to always, uh, I, I now have a, a team, um, with agents that work on my team. I'm always, um, very vigilant attention to detail discipline when working with the clients. My big passion on real estate was really expanding my network. And in the last year, three years, um, I've greatly expanded my network. Yes, um, you have. It's, I mean, it's been, it's been a, a blessing and, and that's the goal. And, and realistically, um, real estate and expanding that network, my, my, that ultimate passion is that coaching and speaking and, and really just empowering people's lives. And, uh, recently I've been getting down that road of things 
with uh, NLP and such. Well, you sold me my house, so you did good. You did good. Uh, it was a it was a privilege getting to work with you. I really appreciate working with you and Katrina. You guys were awesome, dude. That was a, that was an easy sale too. It was. I mean, you she just picked it, it out. Boom. You guys made it fun. You you made it fun, and you know you just uh, you got another one of our soon to be members. Coming downtown. I know, I know. Coming to Murfreesboro. That's exciting. He About moves, 10 more days. Uh, 10 more days. That's super Dave exciting. Rogers yeah. coming into town, which that's going to be, but we should get him on that too. Cause Dave's, he's got a lot, he's got a, he's got a good story just like Greg does. It's exciting. What exactly is NLP? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. That's, that's such a, uh, Deep question, but but I'll definitely give us a little something to kind of go off of. NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. And so those words, think of neurology, um, linguistic as words, and programming. Um, it, obviously, we know what that is. So Sorry, I just Barney styled it. So this and this, <laughs> that's what that is, this and this. The, so here's, here's, here's kind of how I tell people, and, and this is my... This is my this is like a thousand hours of learning wrapped up into a sentence. So so there's a lot to unpack in this sentence. This sentence doesn't say it all. Um, but what I, where, where, the way I share, tell people kind of express what NLP is, is um, so if anyone hasn't studied Ivan Pavlov, you guys, Ivan Pavlov. OK, um, Pavlov's bill. So just just you just Google him and check him out if you haven't. I won't I won't spend too much time there. But um, so Ivan Pavlov, he was able to do a study and with a tune and fork, he would make dogs salivate. And so this was clear evidence that so all our words are agreed upon. They are agreed upon sounds uh, that we as a society have agreed that what meaning they will have. So what I mean is when I say if I said window, the word is just a sound. We agreed that that sound every time we make it window would mean the thing on the wall that we look out of. And that's imperative for a society to exist. I say all that to say, to preframe that our words are just sounds. They're just sound waves. They're just noises that we make. Okay. And then Ivan Pavlov proved that sounds, i.e. a tune and fork, has neurological responses, which can create physiological responses, i.e. the dog salivating. So if sounds can have a neurological response and cause a physiological response, and our words are sounds, then all of our words have a neurological response and create a physiological response. And then with that understanding, how do our words create neurological responses? And that's the study of NLP. Dude, that's so cool. Yeah. That is that's pretty yeah. mind blowing. Yeah, it, it, is. It, it is. It is mind. <laughs> it, is, it is mind blowing. And and how how like our our language and what we allow ourselves to think and even, even all of the, so that the timeline therapy, we talked about that a little bit. Um, it's a way of processing past traumas and, um, our trauma is store. It's a stored memory. And, um, and, and it's, and, and then there's a way uh, essentially of words or sounds that are going to have a neurological response and allow the processing of that memory. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's deep. So, uh, the way, the way I measure success is it's not where you're at. It's the path that you travel to get there because not everybody's on the same level. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you went from being abused at three years old to uh, running away from home to finding your way into a, like a boy's home or mm -hmm. what do you call it? And then the Marine Corps, um, sales, NLP, where is Greg P is going to be 10 years from today? No, oh, good question. Yeah. So 10 years, um, my goal. So the big picture, uh, I want to, I want to be traveling the world. I want to, so I want to have, um, we'll take it from top to bottom. Someone asked me a similar question the other day. So I'm going to use lean right. in on a little bit of those. Um, from a financial standpoint, I want to have multiple streams of passive cash flow that generate that net over a million dollars a year. I want to have enough. I want to create businesses in whatever amount that I need to that I can provide over 100,000 careers for other people. I want to have a coaching business with coaches that work under me. And I want to impact and empower as many people as possible. 
um, part of my my journey, what I you guys may have heard me share. I'm gonna um, tell this little unicorn story. I don't know if you guys ever heard it before. Um, I actually posted on Facebook the other day, and I share it all the time. If I told you guys that just outside this this door behind us, if I said that there was a unicorn out there, you wouldn't believe me. And you wouldn't believe me because of every single exposure you've had up till now in life. If you had had different exposures, there could have been room for belief of a unicorn. But given every single exposure you've had, you don't believe that there's a unicorn, not even enough to validate and get up and check. Once upon a time, I didn't believe what I can do today because of all the experiences I had up until that point. And I didn't believe that I could do today what I do today so much so that I wouldn't even validate it and try. Now, if I told you guys to just go walk out that door and if I said, when you look and there's no unicorn, you'll prove me wrong and we'll just put this to bed. And you said, okay. And so you got up and you walked and you seen a unicorn. You would have a burning desire to make sure everyone else knew that unicorns actually existed. And so my ultimate chief burning desire is the motivational speaking because I want everyone to know what they actually can do. All the people that don't believe what they can do, I seen the unicorn. So I have a burning desire to make them know. So in 10 years from now, I want to be speaking on stages. I mean, with, with a hundred thousand people, um, hearing me speak. That's pretty scary. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. (laughs) And I do believe there's probably a unicorn. It's It's out there, there, man. It's out there. (laughs) What about, uh, Sasquatch is he out there? <laughs> the Yeti, the Yeti yeah, is yeah. out there. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't know, but but that is that is. But you know, if you did see one, if you seen a unicorn, you would like. There's no way you right. could hold that secret in. Yeah, it's called a CWO five or the gunner. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I but had. I feel that I feel the same way. Like there's people that don't that don't believe in themselves right now, and like it's like I can't hold the secret in. Like I got to like I don't know, um, I don't know what word will be the sound vibration that creates the neurological response for them. But I will try every word until I hit the right one. Amen. Amen to that. So goals, (laughs) goals. That's what I call goals, man. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Commander, how are we on, uh, how are we on time, sir? Uh, we're at an uh, hour and 22 minutes. Wow. Wow. The longest, the longest, the longest podcast we've ever had. That's awesome. That's exciting. It'll be a good one for people to listen to. Yes. I really appreciate you guys yeah. uh, allowing me to be Thank on you here. so much, Greg. Thank I've you for your service, man. Thanks Thank for coming you out and talk to us. Yeah, I love you, man. Especially Fleek. He paved the way for all of yeah, us. Yeah, he did. He paved the way for all of us. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Us uh, my, grand, my grandparents paved the way. That's awesome. I have a you. long line of sailors in, in my family. Hoorah. I've, hoorah. My Sorry. great-grandfather hoorah. was a uh, sailor on wooden boats in World War One. Wow. Damn. My, uh, That's impressive. His son, my so, I, so I was quick story. I, I was fortunate enough when I was a teenager. I had seven grandparents, at uh, four regular grandparents, and three great grandparents. So, so I had wow. uh, four of them were grandmothers. Three of them were grandfathers. All three of them are combat veterans. My great grandfather, he was a, like I said, he was in the navy on wooden bo- boats in World War One. His son, um, my grandfather, is probably one of my biggest idols in my life. He served with the old Hickory 3rd Division in World War II. Um, he fought Hitler's SS Division wow. not once but twice and dismantled them both times so bad where Hitler himself nicknamed my grandfather's unit um, Roosevelt's SS Division. <laughs> that's, nice. that's awesome. And, and my uh, other grandfather, that's on my mom's side, my grandfather on my dad's side, he was in World War II. He was in the Navy in World War II. He was actually in boot camp when the uh, Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So his first uh, his first assignment out of boot camp was to uh, assist and clean up in, at Pearl. Wow. So he's filling body bags and wow. stuff. Yeah. Wow. That's a, that's a great, great line of heritage. Yeah. All of so that's why I do what I do today. Yeah. Everything I do today um, is... Um, legacy, you know what I'm saying? So I always try to, uh, like, what can I do to top what my grandparents did? I mean, you can't top that. No. I'm just saying I want to uh, kind of, to to I want to be in their yeah, shadows. Yeah, you know what yeah, I'm yeah. saying? And, and what <laughs> yeah. we're doing with you, Greg, is is yeah. holding on to your legacy by being yeah. on this show yeah, that's and telling incredible. your story. That's incredible. Yeah. So our goal, when I first approached Andrew and asked him if he'd be my co-host, 
I told them, uh, you know, my goal was to uh, get stories out there because there's guys out there with similar stories. I just want them to know that they're not alone. There's people that have similar stories yeah. out there. I've, I've literally gotten Facebook messages from people I'd never met in my life. Hey, man, thanks for that story, man. I listened to your podcast. That's exactly what I needed today. And that keeps me going to do the next one. What other countries have listened to us? There's a so, whole bunch of them, right? Yeah, so we added another country this this week. No way. Yeah, Mozambique. Mozambique. Ooh, so awesome. so far our uh, podcast is obviously 92% is the United States, but uh, 2% in Pakistan. We have three listeners in Pakistan. We That's have awesome. two listeners in New Zealand, two listeners in Mozambique, Brazil, India, Philippines, and Austria. That's so cool. Awesome. And That's we're only awesome. on, like, this is what our, I think our ninth episode. We're already in a handful of countries across the globe. That's incredible. It's a great message. And you're part of yeah. that. And you're part of this. I'm, yeah. I'm glad to be. I'm excited yeah. to be. Yeah, That's we really appreciate cool. it. That's pretty cool. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Commander. Yep. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you guys. guys. Until yep. uh, next week. Until next week. Take care, guys. Bye.